Okay, so I think we can start. Here we are with uh, Michael and Martin. They will talk us about uh, system in the ingest and how to survive in stretch. So please welcome them warmly. <laughs> hello. So hello everyone. We are glad to be here. Thanks for coming. This is Michael Bibel, I'm Martin Pitt, and we are the current maintainers of SystemD in Debian, and I also maintain it in Ubuntu. So we want to review the challenges that we had with the SystemD migration in Jesse, and also take a look at some planned and potential changes for Stretch, and of course show you how to get involved. So big thanks to Tolle Fokhein and Michael Stappelberg, who did a great job of maintaining SystemD in the past. Unfortunately, they don't have time anymore. Also thanks to Marco Dietri, the former UDEV maintainer who is still around for answering questions and giving some advice. And also to several contributors like Didi Roche who really helped us to crack some tough nuts like the FS check integration. And to some new contributors like uh, Philippe Sartela who are starting to get involved. But we always need more help. So. Uh, this shows a rough timeline of uh, bringing systemd into Debian. So the discussions about uh, switching to a more modern init systems really started already in 2007, with uh, Upstart at the time, of course. Systemd wasn't around yet. And since then, we've seen an ever-increasing pressure from some upstreams and administrators to use features like LogInd or the journal. And towards the end of 2013, the pressure finally got high enough to seriously propose a switch. And uh, I hadn't actually been a Debian systemd maintainer until then, so I was following the, the big technical committee discussion with great interest, especially since I was involved in the boot stack and plumbing stack on the Ubuntu side, and I was one of the systemd proponents. So Debian fought with itself uh, for many, many months at the time. <laughs> and we, we also remember that bad time when like, essentially all technical uh, development stopped and we gave, went into these great flame wars and some external participants even proclaimed that this would be the end of all freedom and choice and we are all going to be enslaved and so on. But in this context, kudos to the technical comedy who, despite of all this noise, remained a really rational and facts-based uh, research to this. And even though the final decision was very close, as we all know, it was very well-founded. And I think in the end, we reached the right decision. And fortunately, most of these, all, these unfounded complaints and runs in the Debian system, the community wore off by, now, by then. And the political discussion essentially died. And people realized, hey, life goes on, and my computer still boots, and we could all go back to our technical work. But then the real work only started for us, because we did the switch only a few months before the Jesse release. And this is like a huge transition. So there was work for us to, 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 to make Jesse releasable. And Michael will now explain us some details about that. So in the end, it t actually turned out to be not that big of a deal when the social uh, aspects of the transition died down. So to actually do the transition, um, we already had a package in Wheezy, which worked uh, of systemd in Wheezy, and that worked quite OK. We, at the time, the decision was made, we had a package in, in Jesse, which, which worked quite OK. But to do the actual uh, switch of the default in its system meant we had to deal with uh, making SysV init actually replaceable. And that wasn't actually that easy because uh, SysV init is a so-called essential package. That means you can, uh, you can just easily remove that package without getting uh, this nice, oh, do you really want to remove that package and shoot yourself in the foot a note by dpackage or app. So what we decided to do was to split up SysV init and uh, make the old SysV init package a transitional package and move the contents of the old package into this VNIT core. And, but you really want to ensure that you always have an, an init system installed. So we introduced a new meta package, an essential meta package called init, and let that new package depend on this VNIT, and which triggered uh, the actual migration to, to the new default init system. So after we, we've done the switch, we actually thought, 
hey, people can now actually switch between uh, multiple init systems for the first time, really, in Debian. That also means maybe if you switch between, say, this 5 init and system D, you want to keep the state between those systems in sync. Say you have a service A under SSV init, you disable it, you later decide to switch to uh, system D, and you, I, at least I would expect that the service, the service state would be transitioned over to the system. So we did quite a lot of effort and work and make it uh, possible to, for users to easily switch between those two systems. It, it also meant additional complexity for us, because if you can't rely on the system CTL tools all, all, always being around, you have uh, to adjust your maintainer scripts, for example. Um, and we re-implemented parts of, of the system uh, D interfaces in a package called init system helpers. Uh, and if you use the H system D, which we um, created along the way, then then you ensure that your package can um, can, in, can be installed under sys5 init and still enable all the services. So that, this was one part, but it also one of the deciding factors of actually switching to system D was um, um, that console kit, an essential component of today's desktop, uh, had been deprecated over the years, and we needed a replacement. And system D log in really provided nice interfaces, and um, this was one of the reasons why upstreams like GNOME decided to switch to log -indie. And since we wanted to uh, really support SysV init, we need a solution for that as well. So uh, we introduced a package called system to shim which was first introduced in Ubuntu. We used that in, in Debian as well, which provides just enough API from, from system D to make system D log uh, run under SysV init. So you still need parts of system D, but you can run SysV init. Uh, even when using a desktop nowadays. So another aspect w which we decided early on was if we do the switch from uh, sysv init to systemd, we didn't want to support all the old config files uh, sysv init used, etcd default, rcs, etc init tab, and stuff like that. The major reason for that was that we would have to carry a patch for that for all eternity. And more importantly, people coming from other distros, people who are used to systemd would have a different experience on Debian, and we didn't want that. So for, for settings which we thought were uh, sensible and feasible to do, we did a one-time migration and moved that over. And still, there was other lots of uh, integration work to do. For example, I mean, there's muscle memory, you type etsy in a D service start, and we still wanted to do uh, the right thing here and to create the LSB hook for that. And I think we succeeded, at least I hope, so that people actually don't realize that they are using systemd. Actually, this happened quite, quite often that people are coming to us and say, hey, uh, I want to use systemd, and, and we tell them, hey, you are already using it. So I think we kind of uh, succeeded at uh, Another aspect uh, some users aren't aware is that we actually did switch the default also on upgrades. And that sounds scary at first, but we, we decided to do that to make new installation and upgraded installations as close as possible. And uh, um, as this is a scary thing to do, we decided to keep a fallback. So the sysv init, uh, the transitional sysv init package we introduced earlier, was repurposed a little bit, and it provides a fallback uh, sysv init binary, uh, which can easily be used, and you can select that in your uh, grab boot prompt to, to boot that in case there, there would have been a problem on upgrades and you get your old sysv init back. So this shows a back graph of our systemd package in Debian. And it starts around August 2014 uh, when the actual switch of the default was made in SID. And as you may know, we released, and th there was a steady increase until the end of 2014. And as you may know, the actual release of Jesse was in April. And we actually, we actually expected there would be a flow of bug reports, but that actually didn't happen. And um, so we, we are actually were kind of surprised by that. There, was, there were some hard bug reports and, um, to track down, but, but in the end, all those issues were fixable. And um, I regularly also try to follow the Debian user and Debian user German mailing lists and, and see if users are having problems and trying to help them and try to understand what kind of problems they have. And so far, it's, it, it has been pretty well, I, I think. It, after, after the, the flamers had died down, um, Debian use, for example, became usable again. 
to watch. So the most important issue users, are, um, at least what I found users are having with System D is that um, System D is stricter in certain regards. For example, if you have um, obsolete uh, FS-type entries, System D um, opts for correctness instead of SysV init, which uh, usually tries to hide errors. And Martin has an example here where this is causing problems. Yeah, so this really helped us a lot to discover bugs which were years old. So my uh, prime example there is the eCryptFS setup swap, which promises you to set up an encrypted swap so that if you encrypt your home directory, you wouldn't leak your data to the swap partition. And it turns out years ago, we made some errors there, in fact, several. And this turned out that for years, we were actually installing systems which either didn't have any swap at all, or even worse, which had an, un an unencrypted swap where you inspected a, an encrypted one. And since neither Upstart or Sys5init actually told you about this, we ran for this for years, and now system people complain and say, hey, you try to configure a swap partition here, but it's not there, so it tells you and gives you the chance to correct that in the, uh, in the emergency system. But yeah, then looks for, look, let's look forward to the future a little bit. Uh, one rather uh, intrusive change that already landed in Stretch is the change of the persistent inter uh, network interface names. In the old system, we just remember the original relatively random kernel name as it appeared the first time with a particular MAC address, and then created dynamic UDEF rules which would assign it the same name on all subsequent plugs or reboots. But there were several problems with that. It was inherently racy. You sometimes ended up with interface names called rename one. And it was disabled for all the virtual machine interfaces and hence but also in the cloud. And it didn't really work with things like read-only root. And if you wanted to do, uh, wanted to create an image but you then want to roll out to like thousands of identical machines, uh, then you got unpredictable names again because the pre-generated rules would, of course, not match any of those machines except one. So in the new system, we never use the kernel names to avoid this kind of race. And we now have a declarative and rather flexible naming policy with, I think, sensible defaults. And you see how they look like now. And of course, it will take some time to get used of those, uh, get used to these, but we survived changing FS tab to your UIDs and similar things in the past, so it's just a transitional pain, and I believe this is finally a better default. And, but of course, if you don't like it, you can tweak the policy or just entirely disable it to just retain the original kernel names. An important thing is that is not, this will not be done for upgrades because the interface names might be hidden in like uh, firewall configuration scripts and so on, there is no way we can transition automatically. So this only applies to new installs. Another new thing is NetworkD. This is a small and lean service to bring up uh, network interfaces, which was designed from the ground up for a hot pluggy and virtual server world. So the conf its configuration is similar in the abstraction level and spirit to IF up down, so you won't have too much trouble with that but you don't need any extra packages or huge shell scripts to set up bridges and VLANs and bonds, and unlike IF up down, it works perfectly well with hot plugging. And it specifically is not meant to be a network manager replacement, so a network manager will continue to be around on desktops. Particularly, it has excellent support for Wi-Fi and dynamic reconfiguration through Dbus and that stuff, which Network D doesn't aim to. You can use it right now in Debian, perfectly well working, but there is no integration with other Debian packages so far. In particular, uh, it does not call ifapp.d scripts, and there is no integration with packages like resolve.conf. These two are things which we really want to work on to make the transition easier. So another ongoing uh, effort is the removal of Etsy uh, RCSD SUSV init scripts. These are the ones which are uh, run through early boot. And these are also the ones which cause the most issues because uh, usually those are the ones which generate uh, dependency cycles. So there's a new contributor called uh, Felipe Sate who got interested and we guided him in, in working on that. 
And he worked on a lynching check, and, and uh, should you watch out for that lynching check, should your package be flagged by that, expect an, an um, bug very soon, because we intend to do a mass bug filing soonishly. And, yeah. Some things we might do, some things we might not do for stretch is KDBus. And KDBus is a, for you who didn't hear about that yet, Linux, uh, KDBus is a Linux kernel implementation of the DBus IPC protocol, which is a general purpose protocol coming from the desktop. And there were several attempts over the years to bring that to the kernel. In our view, the, 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 the real core benefits of, of having uh, DBus in the kernel is having it available during the whole lifetime of the system, during early boot and late shutdown. So far, KDBus hasn't been merged yet uh, in the upstream kernel. It might be proposed for uh, 4.3, and I would say it has good chances to be merged, and um, we'll see how that goes. At least, uh, con uh, coming to the user space part, you also need a component which sets up KDBus. Currently, systemd is the only user space implementation for that, and actually systemd in uh, testing and, and SID is already able to set up KDBus. And KDBus is also available as an out-of-tree module. So you could easily build KDBus, test it on your system, and it's easily, uh, actually so easy to do that we decided to create a DKMS module, prepare that today on uploaded it, and this laptop actually is running KDBus today. There will be some, some issues, um, but if you want to try it, I think we're going to upload it to Experimental. Just uh, install the DKMS uh, package and test it and report bugs. So two other interesting issues, which uh, we don't have the time to go into, are presets, which could be interested for uh, deriv derivatives who don't want a different set of packages to be installed, and systemd boot, which is a very simple uh, boot uh, loader for FE. Right. And then there is uh, further changes which we, the two of us don't actually plan working on, uh, but which would nevertheless be interesting projects if someone else is interested, then please come and talk to us. Uh, one of these would be using systemd in the InitRamFS. Right now, InitRamFS tools uses a kind of a homegrown uh, shell-based init system, and it could be replaced by a systemd init, which would ease the handover between InitRamFS and the real operating system and also avoid some race conditions. And you also get nice things, like you have the entire boot in the journal, and it's much easier to debug in at Ramafest and stuff. Uh, this could also be influenced by the decision whether we actually keep in at Ramafest tools or move to Draycut. There was a buffer about that on Monday, but at this point in time, it's not quite clear yet where we go. And the next thing is the Dep helper integration, which pretty much affects all the package maintainers which, uh, who ship unit files. Uh, you will be very familiar with the usual trinity of dhsystemd enable and dhinstall init and then dhsystemd start, which feels a bit clumsy because this was kind of bolted onto the side at the time. But now that systemd is the primary init system, I think it's really time to unify all that and simplify it again. Okay. And so thanks for the warning. So I'll skip some bits here. And finally, with, uh, some, something else which, all of, which affects all of us is to actually make use of all the shiny features that systemd offers to us. So using timers and paths and socket activation or security confinement, with just two extra lines in a unit file, you can actually restrict your service to be much more like a confined container and having great isolation. And so far, we don't really exploit that a lot. So in case you got interested in any of these topics, please come and talk to us. And, and you can reach us on, on this mailing list or on IRC. Uh, we are there uh, and just, just poke us. But you can also just help uh, filing bug reports, working on bug reports. And if you want to hack on systemd itself, systemd um, is managed in Git on Alias uh, via Git build package. And as a closing note, if you want, um, there is a buff tomorrow, which, you can, which we try to show you uh, just in case you have problems with systemd, how you can debug those problems. So thanks for your attention, and I'm not sure if I have quest uh, time for one or more two questions. So thanks again.
can ask for a yeah. couple of questions. Started a little okay. late, but yeah, should no. be okay. Uh, you mentioned NetworkD. Why should I use that, and what is it good for? Do you take that, Martin? Um, yeah. What well, as I said, it is uh, mostly useful to have a very small solution which covers all the, the, the server-side cloudy uh, virtual interfaces because they, unlike IF up down, where everything comes in different packages and doesn't, isn't very well integrated, uh, the, the daemon basically sorts out all the race conditions, correct bring up of nested interfaces and so on. Um, the, but the, as import, the important part about NetworkD is that it's event-based. It sees devices coming and go. IF up down is started during boot and then it's done. And so it sits a little bit in between of if up down and up to network manager. So. I would just like to thank you uh, deeply because I don't think many people realize the pressure and the shitstorm you have been through. And I'm very grateful for your work. Thank you very, very much. Thank you. <laughs> thank you. Thank you. Thank you. Okay, well so then, thanks everyone. Oh, well, there's one more. Not sure if you still have time, but okay. Uh, what about systemd in DI? <laughs> <laughs> I had that on the notes. I tried not to do it to not upset Cyril too much. <laughs> well, it's essentially the same story if it's the shell based home ground init system, and in theory, you want to think about replacing that with systemd. I have no idea whether that would make a lot of sense or bring a lot of improvement. Uh, we just didn't look at it, into it if, at all. If anyone is interested in, in yeah. looking into that, yeah, you're more than welcome. <laughs> but I think uh, the, more pro uh, the higher priority should be the in drama fest because that happens all the time while installing just happens once and it's like less visible. Well. I'm not sure whether is it whether it is easy to answer that in this auditorium, but how did you manage to keep your health when dealing with this upstream? Well, well actually, upstream, um, I, I find him hmm. pretty well uh, to work with. So, I mean, he, he's, he, he has a clear mind, he speaks his mind, and he's, I think he's honest about what he says. And sometimes people don't like that, and he's, maybe he comes off as some, hmm. yeah, sometimes as abrasive. But Actually, we have a pretty good relationship with upstream. Mm -hmm. And I also must say, Lona really learned to become a really great maintainer. So he dutifully re reviews patches, and of course he's very picky, and that's good. Technical excellence helps us all. Uh, but like he's not discriminating because we come from Debian or Ubuntu or whatnot. And now, I mean, the system is far more than just Leonard by now. There are, mm -hmm. like the core team is like five, six people, and by now there is hundreds of contributors mm -hmm. who send more than 20, 30 patches. <laughs> So it's really a big community project these days. Yeah, and he actually asks us if there's stuff that is uh, upcoming. Then he says, oh, do you have some input from the Debian side? So at least I feel included in, yeah. in, in, in the Fine. decision process. Mm -hmm. And we are upstream committers. So in theory, you could break stuff ourselves. But of course, we always go if through the review to. process. <laughs> and, <yeah. laughs> so uh, you just talked about removing the S renewable scripts. Oh. Uh, yeah. I know, because I, I worked a bit on OpenRC, not I as much as I wanted, but anyway, I know that it's full and full and full of hacks uh, that That's we true. build up over time. I'm just curious, uh, if you want to remove them, then what's going to happen to Sys5 in it? Well, you don't remove them. You just add support for systemd with native service file. You don't remove the RCSD in its scripts uh, when doing that. Okay. So but we need to have the NFT script by so. policy, so we can't do this. So, so I'm not sure uh, how we are with time and give the other ones uh, uh, room uh, time to prepare. So I think we should stop at this point. Yeah. Right. Okay. So thanks again for coming, and you, you can meet us outside in the hall. Right. Okay. Thank you. Thank you.